505 million year old chitin. Now that we're starting to look for original biomolecules, we're finding them everywhere. A 505 million year old sponge was recently carbon 14 dated, and therein lies a couple of tales. <coughs> the paper involved is uh, Ehrlich et al and uh, it's published in nature.com and you can look it up on the internet but it's in scientific reports so this is in the peer-reviewed literature this is real now the sponge itself is on the left a magnification of part of the sponge is on the right um, you'll see the whole slide in just a little bit but this is the this is the biggest part of it and the sponge, another species of, the, or another specimen of the sponge is found here, and you can see the quarter for scale, which probably makes more sense than the, than the centimeter bar before that. And this is what they're supposed to look like um, in real life. Of course, this is an artist's reconstruction, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a general form rather than a precise uh, delineation of some particular fossil let alone some form that we've actually seen. Here's a close-up um, uh, of the material, and uh, for what it's worth, this f uh, forms the background for our slide. It's taken from the article itself. Sponges are probably the earliest branching animals, and their fossil record dates back to the Precambrian, before the Cambrian even. Identifying their skeletal structure and composition is thus a crucial step in improving our understanding of the early evolution of metazoans. So they, this is slanted heavily towards evolution, of course. <coughs> Here we present the discovery of 505 million year old chitin um, found in exceptionally well-preserved Vauxia uh, gracilenta sponges from the middle Cambrian Burgess Shale. Yeah the old Burgess Shale that you've heard about from way back when. Our new findings indicate that, given the right fossilization conditions, chitin is stable for much longer than previously suspected. Yeah. Not just suspected, thought possible, but anyway. The preservation of chitin in these fossils opens new avenues for research into other ancient fossil groups. <coughs> Introduction, chitin, C8H1305N, uh, polymer, is a chain polymer of N-acetylglucosamine, which is one of the most chemically and thermally stable derivatives of glucose. This structural aminopolysaccharide is the main component of the cell walls of fungi. The exoskeletons of insects and arthropods, that is lobsters, crabs, shrimps, and, you know, insects, and spiders for what it's worth. I mean, the whole, the whole thing. The radulas of mollusks and the beaks of cephalopods, including squid and octopus. So their biting apparatus is not made of bone. It's made out of this hard chitin stuff. Now, <clears throat> a little ref refreshment for some of you. Uh, some of you already know this, but, um, and some of you probably will blow by anyway, but uh, for some of you, it may be helpful to realize. This is glucose. Now, it's drawn without the hydrogens that are stuck everywhere where it isn't shown. Um, but that's, uh, the skeleton will make it a little easier to see. We're going to take that hydroxyl group, and we're going to take it off and substitute an amino. And now you have glucosamine. That's the stuff you take for your joints. Um, <clears throat> You know, glucosamine and chondroitin and all that stuff. And then, if you take off that hydrogen there, and you put on an acetyl group, you have an acetyl glucosamine. And if you take off uh, water, hydrogen on one end and oxygen and hydrogen on the other, or vice versa, I mean, it doesn't really matter too much, 
although probably when it's doing the biochemistry it's that particular oxygen and then you you join that to a long group that has a whole bunch of these in a row you now have a uh, chitin now this particular formula formula is beta chitin in order to make alpha chitin you just switch that oxygen to a down position all if you look at it everything is equatorial just like glucose um, in the ring it all sticks out the same way um, and you move it down to there and now you have alpha chitin and the interesting thing is that although alpha cellulose or pardon me alpha uh, alpha polyglucose is more easily broken apart than beta polyglucose beta polyglucose is cellulose alpha polyglucose is is um, amylose or um, you know it's a starch which is a lot more easily to break a, apart in the case of chitin the alpha formula is more stable but anyway until recently the oldest preserved chitin dates to the oligocene about 25 million years old and to the late eocene 34 to 36 million years old despite reports of exceptional fossil preservation in the middle cambrian Kali formation in Guizhou province China uh, via carbonaceous films or fossilized fungal hyphae and spores from the Ordovician of Wisconsin so there's a few people who have measured chitin around maybe a little bit of it um, with an age of about 460 million years old there is a dearth of information about chitin identification in these studies the oldest chitin protein molecular signatures were found in a Pennsylvanian scorpion cuticle and Silurian 417 million year old Eurypterid uh, that's uh, a sea scorpion which isn't really a scorpion it's more closely related to horseshoe crab uh, cuticle by Cody and co-workers recent work has demonstrated that chitin also occurs within skeletons of recent marine um, and they give some examples there as well as freshwater sponges sponges or periphera probably include the earliest branching extant animal groups and their fossil record dates back to the e Ediacaran before the Cambrian biomarkers suggest an even older origin conventional date uh, greater than one billion years um, I think this is a uh, finding stuff in the in the fossil uh, in the rocks um, but uh, it is it is still unknown which sponges form the earliest branching group since the fossil record of these keratose sponges is poor due to the absence of mineralized spicules they don't have things that will hang around for a while and so they could just kind of disappear the Voxidae are among the best known taxa in the Middle Cambrian Burgess Shale in British Columbia, Canada, although their interpretation remains controversial. Voxidae sponges exhibit an apparently reticulate as aspiculate fibrous skeleton. It doesn't have the traditional spicules that most sponges do. Um, assuming an aspiculate organic skeleton, Rigby suggested an affiliation with the modern keratosa particularly the Varangida. Although this view has been widely adopted, the nature of keratosa and those relationships have not been fully resolved. So there's still some research that they're doing trying to make sense of this all. The object of the current study was to test the hypothesis that chitin was essential skeletal component of early sponges assigned to Varangida. For this, we have studied the 505 million year old, that is Middle Cambrian, Burgess Shale, Vauxia, sponge samples because of the exceptional preservation of these fossils in the following we demonstrate that chitin is indeed a component of early sponges we found chitin preserved in Voxia gracilenta from the Burgess shale making these sponges the oldest fossils with preserved chitin discovered thus far they're giving you their conclusion first so that you can know where they're going this suggests that the Burgess shale fossils retain more structural and potentially isotopic information if you have original material you can tell which carbon isotopes which oxygen isotopes and so forth might be in them 
than previously realized. This is important to the realm of sponge phylogeny, where sponges came from, and has impact across the broader world of Cambrian paleontology. That is, you know, how much fr uh, freezing was going on at the time and so forth. <clears throat> Stringent care was taken in the preparation of our samples in the analytical protocol to avoid any modern contaminants. And I think they su succeeded beyond what they think they did. These methods are described below. And now they're going to give you the results. Traditional papers gave you the introduction and then the methods and then the results. But they'll have their methods afterwards, so if you have further questions, you can look at them. That's more modern <coughs> way of writing things. Identification of the polysaccharide containing remains. This is what they're actually doing. The fossilized material concern, uh, consists of brownish and astomosing fibers, diameter about 100 millimeters, in an arrangement typical of voxia. And uh, we'll look at that figure again. The dimension of the fibers is characteristic of peripherence. There are no reports of fungi or filamentous bacteria containing any fibers of similar diameter. See for comparison reference four. In our preparation and analytical protocol, which is described in the following, we tried to avoid any possible problems that may arise from modern contaminants. So they've been very careful and they're getting only the sponge stuff and not, some, not something else, okay? And there's the, there's the figure one itself and you've seen the top part of this already, and uh, the bottom part, you've, uh, you've seen the top part of that. Uh, I'm gonna zoom up as close as we can get without starting to deteriorate the pixels. This is one-to-one -one pixels. That's what you see. And you can see these little fibers that are running crisscross. A carbon-14 analysis <coughs> only yielded a low fraction of modern carbon of 0 0.0057. What does that mean? Uh, they'll talk about where modern is defined as 95% of the radiocarbon. I think there's a, um, of uh, NBS oxalic acid, um, uh, normalized to uh, delta 13 carbon of uh, PDB, belemnite stuff. In, that's minus 19, and this confirms that the analyzed organic material must contain ancient carbon. You see, what they did is the carbon-14 date, and they're reporting it as fraction modern carbon, and what that means is that 99.4% of, uh, of the material they're getting dates old at least 99.4, that you can't put more than about 0.05%, 0.057 I think it is, we'll see, we'll get that date a little more accurately later, um, that you can't put more than one two hundredth or so, one one eightieth of the material as new stuff, at least new from the last 5,000 years or so. <clears throat> Raman spectroscopy of the organic material suggests that all investigated samples had the same origin with respect to thermal low-grade metamorphism. The results from the DNA identification study revealed the absence of DNA in the material isolated from fossil uh, uh, Vaxia gracilenta. This is a good indicator that there are no modern bacteria or fungi contaminants in the fossils or in the instrumentation used to identify them. At least if there is any contamination, it's of dead body parts, not living organisms because the living organisms would have some DNA still left in them. Initially, three samples were examined under a fluorescence microscope to highlight any polysaccharide-based organic matter using the specific calcofluor white staining. Calcofluor white is a fluorescent biomarker capable of making hydrogen bonds with beta-1,4 and beta-1,3 linked polysaccharides, which beta-1,4 happens to be um, uh, the uh, chitin linkage. 
and shows a high affinity for chitin, not surprisingly. Recently, it was confirmed experimentally that CFW specifically binds to carbohydrate residues and not to the protein matrix. So they're actually getting chitin, not the protein that's around the chitin, even when staining glycoproteins. We used material from the third fossil sample. We selected areas on the surface of sample where the fibrous morphology of the voxia skeleton is clearly <coughs> visible in a binocular microscope. You saw the picture. And then stained them with CFW. The skeleton was stained with variable intensity, which is clearly visible using fluorescence microscopy, figure 2A and B. We're going to see figure 3, which shows some of that staining that they did. We found several fragments, supplementary information, um, that were highly stained by CFW and precisely resembled the fibers observed by electron microscopy in size and shape. The staining looks like it's on the stuff. These preliminary results indicate the presence of polysaccharide material localized within the well-preserved fossilized fibers of the sponge skeleton. Selected fibers showing the presence of polysaccharides were carefully broken from the host rock using a very sharp steel needle under a stereo microscope. Ching, ching, ching. Then some of the fa fragments obtained in this way and showing a well-preserved fibrous structure, figure three, which we'll look at in a minute, were investigated as removed using light, fluorescence, and scanning electron microscopy. The majority of the fragments were transferred to plastic vessels with, and watch what they did with it, 48% hydrofluoric acid for 24 hours. That'll eat your skin off at room temperature to remove aluminosilicates. It does a very nice job in getting rid of silicon dioxide. Following this, the samples were centrifuged and the insoluble residue was washed five times using deionized water. Pour the water in, stir it around a little bit, centrifuge it, pour the water off. That's how you wash it. And here's uh, the figure three. And you can see one of the spicules that they've broken off from this area. And you can see that it lights up very nicely with that uh, calcofluor white. And here's uh, a little bit of the, uh, uh, what it looks like under the scanning electron mis microscope. And you can see it has a structure that doesn't look like it came from any geologic process. <coughs> looks like it's original material. The residual material was placed on glass slides that had been cleaned in acetone. Microfibers or microparticles were excluded from the slide using light and fluorescent mi microscopy. You see something that doesn't look like what we're looking for, we take it out. The 25 slides with the residual material were observed using light and fluorescent mi microscopy, and we isolated fragments possessing fibrillar microstructure. All of these showed strong autofluorescence in the region 470 to 510 nanometers, consistent with that of chitin. That's basically shining a uh, uh, kind of a near ultraviolet or, or violet light on them. And they fluoresce. Identification, how do you know it's really chitin instead of something that just looks like chitin? Our criteria for the positive identification of chitin are based on comparative investigations between a chitin standard and selected samples using the highly sensitive analytical techniques shown below, as well as the detection of deglucosamine and the use of the chitinase test. <coughs> Thus, selected samples of isolated material were analyzed by near-edge X-ray absorption fine structure spectroscopy, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, and transmission electron microscopy. The last one some of you may have run into. Uh, so they're using all kinds of really quite modern ways of identifying what's, what material is actually in there, what kind of compounds. Chitin, which may be considered a polymer of 2-acetamide, 2-deoxy-CXD-glucopyranose, uh, or N-acetyl-D-glucosamine, which is the more con conventional, uh, simpler way of saying it. When a, you hydrolyze it, it yields D-glucosamine. Detection of D-glucosamine is required as the final step in supporting the survival of the chitin in the fossil record. See, when you put this in acid, first you break it up into monomers, and then you, at the same time, you take off the acetyl group. So all you got left is glucosamine. If you don't get glucosamine, 
It isn't chitin. Other samples were hydrolyzed to test for the presence of D-glucosamine using HPLC, uh, high-performance size exclusion chromatography. Um, I think they used to call that Cephadex way back when. Um, high-performance capillary electrophoresis and electrospray ionization mass spectrometry. So they're trying all kinds of stuff to make sure that this stuff really is D-glucosamine. One fragment was also used for experimental chitinase di digestion. There's an enzyme out there that digests chitin. And it breaks it into an acetyl D-glucosamine because it doesn't bother the acetyl groups. It just chops off the, the various um, uh, pieces of the chitin to uh, monomers. In all these experiments, the samples from the surrounding rock of the analyzed fibers were tested as a negative control. In other words, you take some of the fibers and then you take some stuff right next to it in the rock, and guess what? The rock doesn't do anything. <coughs> the results of the structural and spectroscopic analyses performed using NEXAFs and F-tier and CFW staining and electron diffraction agreed that the demineralized fibrous material isolated from a fossilized V. gracilenta consists in part of alpha chitin. The results of our analysis for the investigative fractions of the fibers were fully consistent with those of previously re previous reports on the physical chemical identification of chitin in other organisms. Chitinase digestion experiments again confirmed the chitinous nature of the isolated V. gracilenta fibers. Additionally, results using those other methods that we talked about clearly indicate that the sample contains a species that is highly similar in its properties to D-glucosamine. The presence of D-glucosamine in the exceptionally preserved fibers, um, fibrous matter which is isolated from the rock, but absence in the surrounding rock clearly shows its fossil origin. That is, the D-glucosamine came from the fossils, not from the rock. Discussion. <clears throat> Experimental studies from most modern organisms suggest that chitin may remain chemically stable enough for paleoecological and paleoclimatic information to be derived from stable isotope analysis. You can take this stuff and you can find out what the oxygen-18 isotopes were on it. The <clears throat> thermal stability of chitin depends on the crystalline form and on the size and perfection of crystallites. The alpha chitin found in arthropods and sponges is thermally more stable than beta chitons that are found in diatoms and squid. Thermogravimetric analyses of purified non-mineralized chitin reveal that the, this amino polysaccharide is stable up to 360 degrees centigrade. You know what that's in Fahrenheit? 680. In other words, they baked this thing like crazy. <coughs> Studies of the survival of chitin in fossils have yielded mixed results. Much paleontological literature still refers to fossil material as being chitinous, based primarily on its resistance to chemical attack and the relationship of fossils to modern organisms, because the modern organisms have chitin as well. It is generally understood, however, that the chitin has probably been converted to a more stable material. Well, that's the way everybody thought until people like these started looking at it carefully. Uh, some analyses have suggested the presence of chitin in fossils that date back as far as the earlier Paleozoic, uh, as evidenced by D-glucosamine, and reference 27 we're going to look at in more detail. That is, these people who were doing this, they weren't the first to find chitin. They were just the first to be able to prove it using all those modern techniques. Other analyses, however, have failed to find any evidence of its presence in fossils, so some people can't find it except for small amounts of amino sugars in the calcified skeletons of one Cretaceous and one Tertiary decapod crustacean. And you can look it up in reference 30. Significant quantities of chitin were detected by analytical pyrolysis in quaternary beetles and in fossil insects from the Oligocene Lacristan shales of Enspil, Germany. So sometimes in the more recent ones, you can find chitin. In all reports, confirmation of the survival of the chitin polymer required the detection of its hydrolysate monomer, D-glucosamine. So that's how you know for sure. Um, 
Here we have demonstrated that chitin may persist for over 505 million years in sediments where suitable paleoenvironmental conditions prevailed. I'm not reading the entire p uh, paper, and I'll skip over their methods and stuff, um, mostly. Uh, the Voxidae are therefore likely to be the most basal definitive demosponge group known, despite the abundance of uh, protomonoxid demosponges in the Cambri Cambrian fossil record. Uh, so they're trying to fit all of this together in an evolutionary tree and having fun with it. Um, <coughs> the phenomenon of exceptional fossil, uh, fossil preservation, especially the preservation of soft tissues, is one of the most disputable questions in modern paleontology. Uh, shall we c c give that an understatement score? <laughs> Different and sometimes controversial modes for this preservation in Burgess Shale fossils have been proposed by Butterfield or Petrovich and Powell, and they've got a reference, as well as by Briggs and Gaines, and they have a reference there. The mechanism of chitin preservation in our case is unknown. It has been suggested that the preservation potential of arthropod cuticle is increased when the chitin is cross-linked in a thick sclerotized cuticle like that of beetles. A phenomenon first dem demonstrated in laboratory experiments, this suggests that chitin preservation is the reason for the abundance of arthropod cuticles preserved organically in the fossil record. So maybe there's something to do with the protein that kind of stabilizes it, maybe. Recently reported preservation of a high nitrogen content chitin protein residue in Paleozoic organic arthropod cuticle likely depends on condensation of cuticle-derived fatty acids onto a structurally modified chitin protein mo molecular scaffold. So you have this chitin protein stuff and you smear it with, uh, somehow with, uh, fatty acids and it, may, and it helps to preserve it, I guess. Uh, <coughs> thus preserving the remnant chitin protein complex and cuticle from degradation by microorganisms. You can't get a handle on it because it's got fat protecting it. I'm not sure how that works, but whatever. There is no information about possible cross-linking agents in sponge chitin similar to those re reported for arthropods. However, Bromtyrosine-related compounds present in the skeletons of recent varangids, that's ones from today, are known to be chitinase inhibitors. So they have there actually some stuff in there to stop chitin from being digested in modern organisms. We suggest that these compounds were crucial for the survival of oxid sponges in the Burgess Shale during early post-burial. Why is that important? Because otherwise there shouldn't be any chitin left. It should all be degraded. Pyrite-like sulfides were also preserved, observed on the surface of the fossil, and they have a photo of that. Intriguingly, the novel taphonomy pathway for chitin preservation, low oxygen and ferrous iron as a chitinase inhibitor. Where have we heard of ferrous iron before? Is that, isn't that one of Schweitzer's uh, proposed modes? Um, <coughs> recently proposed by Weaver and co-workers cannot be excluded as a mechanism in Voxia fossils. The ability to isolate and identify chitin from a 505 million year old fossil is due to several factors. These include the exceptional preservation conditions of the locality. Remember this is a Burgess Shale. Um, the stabilizing effects of bromotyrosine re related compounds specific to the Voxia sponges and certainly due to the advances in analytical techniques that are routinely available today. We can do a better job uh, than people used to be able to do. Uh, notice they have to explain why the chitin is still around, because it shouldn't be, because it should be degraded. It should hydrolyze slowly, but naturally. Our discovery significantly extends the length of time chitin can survive under geological conditions, Considering that the oldest chitin reported previously is 417 million years old, well, except for reference 27, we hope that our exceptional finding will encourage researchers to search for chitin in other well-preserved ancient fossils. So maybe there's more of this stuff and we just never were looking for it. Soft tissue found all over the place. Now, what about that reference 27? This is Carlisle. In 1964, 
That's a long time ago, over 50 years now. Uh, <coughs> Chitin and a Cambrian fossil, and you can get this on the internet. Um, to summarize, I'm just going to quote his summary because otherwise there's a whole paper there. Uh, well it's, it's only about two pages, so it's not that bad. The organic constituents of hyalith hyalithellus, this is a, uh, they think now an annelid worm, it's a tube, tube worm, I think it may be the tube itself, but it's made out of chitin, include chitin and protein, probably a scleroton, which have persisted unchanged for 550 million years. Now you're going, wait a minute. They said it was only 505. It actually turns out to be the same Middle Cambrian. Um, it's just that the date for the Cambrian has shifted with time and has come down a little bit. And so now they won't claim 550, they'll only claim 505. Um, two, acid hydrolysis yields D-glucosamine and half a dozen amino acids, including alanine, serine, and proline. So they're getting, uh, serine degenerates pretty easily. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a story behind the degeneration of serine. This is fascinating. And three, enzymatic degradation with fungal chitinase yields in acetyl glucosamine, just like our paper did. 64, they knew this 50 years ago, well, somebody knew it 50 years ago, and people have just kind of been ignoring it because it can't be. Um, until now, we're finding out that things that can't be are all over the place. Maybe they still can't be, and they're just uh, under it, or overestimating the age. But anyway, carbon-14 analysis of possible modern contamination. This is the part that got me really interested. Fossil sample was clean, ground, and sieved, 63 mesh size. Carbon contents were measured with an elemental analyzer, so they took this stuff, ground it up, put it in, uh, and they measured how much carbon was there to make sure that they actually had enough carbon to do the job. Um, <coughs> and coupled with a mass spectrometer, so they, they fed this into this fancy machine. After the hydrochloric acid treatment, now, so uh, th this is like really high hydrochloric acid. Uh, like one molar or, b or better. Um, <coughs> the uh, treatment, the sample s was split. A part of it was washed for six hours in a saturated sodium pyrophosphate solution with 0.5% sodium hydroxide. 0.5% uh, so molecular weight of sodium hydroxide is 40, so this is like 20 grams per, this is like about 2% uh, um, sodium hydroxide. That'll eat your skin off. The solution was changed every hour, so they're really trying to get rid of any contaminants. Afterwards, the sample was washed three times with water and then three times for one hour with two molar um, sulfuric acid. That's battery acid. That'll eat your hands off, too. Um, <coughs> A second part of the sample was washed three times for one hour with 10% uh, potassium chloride and 35% nitric acid. That'll eat your hands off. The samples, I'm sure this is a mistake in the uh, process. It should be the samples then were freeze dried and graphitized in accordance with a standard way of doing things. The carbon content of both sample parts were changed by less than 0 0.05, so they're not adding carbon, they're not taking away carbon. Uh, they're leaving all the original sample. Um, well, uncertainty of 10%, so maybe it's a little more, a little less, but it's, they're not really losing much. The AMS me uh, measurements were performed at the GINA AMS system, a standard carbon-14 laboratory, if I recall correctly, in Germany. Um, <coughs> and here's a figure, we're going to show it to you. Conversion of the measured carbon-14 concentration of 0 0.057. Now, that, that sounds like a very small carbon-14 con concentration until you realize that what they usually can do is compare it with percent modern carbon, and in that case, it's 0.57% modern carbon. 
uh, into calendar years with the program OxCal. So they're going to they're going to give you an actual date. As calibration curve, the intercal 36 for the northern hemisphere was used. Red balloon, gray curves. It's a bunch of details about what they're doing. Um, and here's the figure. And I want you to notice the date. It's 44,000, maybe 43,000, somewhere in there. That's not quite half a billion, is it? A little bit less. Well, we're going to compare it with Baumgartner's data in just a minute. Yes. Yes, we're going to do that. Okay. <coughs> And, uh, you know, they have a one sigma, they have two sigmas, they have three sigmas, and you notice that it's a slanted curve so that it isn't a perfect bell curve. It's kind of off to one side. Um, the material is less than 0.6% modern. Wait a minute. Did this thing eat a slide on me? Just a minute here. Yes. I don't know. Oh, let's go back to uh, what I was going to say in between. Materials less than 0.6% modern. It could still be replacement. I mean, if it was replaced 5 million years ago, it would still date infinite age, essentially. Bacteria do not produce chitin, so you can't explain this on the basis of bacteria putting in the new material. Um, it approximately matches coal, and we're going to look at that. Animals tend to have a little more carbon-14, uh, but deep-sea creatures tend to have less carbon-14 than, than surface animals. Um, and that's true today, and it's probably true back then. Um, and so here's the, here's the rate group's data, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to line that curve up precisely with their data. Uh, first of all, I must note that, that they subtracted out a background. Uh, the, the real background is probably more like the blue line, but you know, the, the certainly the um, certainly the either one is these are well above above normal background. And here's where this data goes. Uh, you can see that the 0 0.6 lines up right at this point here. The 0.3 is now lined up along that line there that's now 0.3. So this is exactly where it belongs. But remember that they've subtracted out background, so these are really higher than that. And if you take add the subtracted in background, you have to move it down a little bit. So this is actually lower than the highest Pennsylvania coal. That is, this is good match. This is a good match for the rate group's coal data. If anything, it's a little on the high side. Go ahead. You're saying that yeah. because, <coughs> because they adjusted for the background? I mean, for... for yeah, if you adjust, the, because, because these because things the counts, have, the counts These things, there. they didn't give you the raw data here. They actually <coughs> subtracted out 0.77% percent, percent moderate, zero point. 0.077% modern carbon. The, they subtracted out this, this much, so I just moved this curve down that much, and that's where it would match. Now, coupled with the Mosasaur data, you may remember that gave you 4.68% modern carbon and 24 1,600 radiocarbon years. This suggests that creationists aren't just making up the data. This suggests that that all the we're finding is the same stuff they're finding, which of course I pointed out ahead of time. Um, there appears to be carbon-14 in even 500 million year old material. That's better than my 300 million year old material that uh, that we were finding earlier. Now. <coughs> Actually, this has been known for a long time, and people have just forgot about it or kind of ignored it. I ran into a 1989 paper, which is just two years after the, well, no. It was 77, so it was 89. It's about 12 years after they really started doing the, uh, 
uh, the uh, accelerated mass spectrometer data. And it's talking about problems associated with the use of coal as a source of carbon-14 for free background material. The problems are that they, it has carbon-14 in it. And you can get this on the internet too for what it's worth. Okay? And for those of you who get the email, those links are in there. For those of you who don't get the email, feel free to ask me and I'll be happy to send you a copy of the email or it'll be with the, uh, when, we, uh, when we put this on the internet, uh, it'll be, that link will be there too. So you don't have to memorize all that stuff. In fact, you can Google it if you, you know, if you're having trouble. The abstract of that paper says, many carbon-14 dating laboratories have established that coal samples exhibit a finite carbon-14 age. Many dating laboratories have established that coal samples exhibit a finite carbon-14 age. Apparently caused by contamination of the specimens before any laboratory preparation is undertaken. Well, it better be, otherwise they're not that old. And you know what that means. Um, <clears throat> in this work, the possibility that the contamination is due to microbial and fungal activity in the coal substrate is considered, and some suggestions are made for alternative sources for background test materials for carbon-14 dating laboratories. In other words, you can't use coal, what can you use? And, and they'll tell you. Um, initial results indicate that geologically formed graphites contain little carbon-14 and are likely to be good background test materials, especially in carbon-14 AMS laboratories, which he turns out to be correct on, by the way. Okay, and just a few, uh, just, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I'm gonna, it's, it's short anyway, but I'm gonna give you some things that are important. The maximum age that can be determined reliably by the carbon-14 dating method is limited by several factors. Now remember, this guy who's writing this is not a creationist. Amongst the most important of which is background. In, in quotes, no less. In the case of carbon-14 dating by accelerator mass spectrometry, where extremely small samples are used, background problems caused by contamination are proportionately greater than for large samples. Three factors may contribute to the background observed during carbon-14 determination using AMS. Number one, the detect limit of detection or machine background. Number two, contamination of the sample during pretreatment and preparation. Those are both laboratory problems. And number three, contamination of the sample prior to any laboratory preparation or analysis. To which I would add number four, maybe it's got carbon-14 in there anyway and you need to just completely junk it as a, <coughs> or it's telling us something about the age. Um, Vogel et al. 1987 have provided an excellent analysis of one and two, that's the laboratory con control problems, by separating out the components of contamination introduced during sample combustion and graphitization as well as the contributed uh, contribution to background by the accelerator system. So they checked it all out. Some of the background samples check, uh, tested by Vogel et al. were specimens of anthracite coal which showed carbon-14 concentrations considerably higher than expected due to machine background ages and contamination during sample preparation. That is, it's really there. When background ages in the vicinity of 50 kilojoules were expected, the coal samples yielded 40 to 45 kilojoules. Um, 45 kilojoules is about half knows that the contamination, uh, quote, contamination, is like twice to four times what you're expecting, more or less. There are many other un unpublished accounts by carbon-14, ooh, wait a minute. This is the ones that they published. There are many other unpublished accounts by carbon-14 laboratories in which the use of coal as a background test material has been investigated. Lots of people have done this. They never published it. Why? Um, <clears throat> in many cases, the samples were found to contain carbon-14, and further studies were discontinued. Oh. Oh. 
Really? What we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. The AMS and the gas counting facilities, DSIR in Lower Hutt, New Zealand, for example, have observed apparent ages for coal specimens ranging from 25 to 40 kilo a year. And the NSF accelerated facility in Tucson, Arizona, which is uh, Joel, this is the guy who is the editor of Radiocarbon, uh, has determined the ages of anthracite samples ranging from 30 to 40 kilo years. They're finding carbon-14 all the time in coal. It's a real problem. Properties of coal, because coal is formed over geologic timescales at depths providing excellent shielding from cosmic rays, its carbon-14 content should be insignificant in comparison to the carbon-14 induced by even the most careful sample preparation techniques used in carbon-14 dating laboratories. It should be way, way, way down there. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> How is it then that a material which should show a carbon-14 age indistinguishable from that produced by a combination of machine background and contamination during careful sample preparation routinely produces a finite carbon-14 age? Routinely produces a finite carbon-14 age. Routinely. All the time. And there's a bunch of it there, and it's unpublished because everybody knows about it, and nobody knows what to do about it, and they don't want to publish it. <coughs> and remember, you get paid for publishing in uh, job security, unless you're Mark Armitage. Uh, <coughs> yes? Uh, I didn't get who wrote this paper. Um, let's see if I can find it for you. Uh, low. Okay. I can't tell you much more about him. But I'm sure you can look him up. Let's get back. One suggestion is that radium, which is present in some cults, they're, they're scratching their heads as to what could possibly do this which is present in some coals at the sub part per million level as a decay product of uranium thorium series may produce carbon-14 during an extremely rare decay event, Rosen Jones. And you can read the rest of the paragraph, but their kind of summary is, the amount of carbon-14 produced by such events derived from radium in coal must be considered as insignificant. And if you don't believe him, you can look up Arata who, who ran the numbers exhaustively, no, no, it's not going to work. Not unless you have the coal is 99% uranium, in which case you should be mining it for uranium instead of coal. <coughs> Microbial and fungal activity in coal. I would like to suggest a simple explanation. Ah, now I don't want you to notice. He hasn't proven it. He's not reporting data that might suggest it. He's just throwing it out as a possibility. For the finite carbon-14 ages observed for many coal specimens, namely microbial and fungal action in coal substrates. The actions of various kinds of fungi and microbes in coal have been well documented. I guess it's fungi. Um, Cohen and Gabriel first reported that fungi Polysporus versicolor and Poria montiola could degrade lignite. The fungus uh, Polysporus versicolor, which is a common species involved in the rotting of wood, incorporates atmospheric CO2 during its growth and thereby introduces carbon-14 into the coal substrate. So maybe this fungus is doing it. Once the coal specimen is contaminated, fungi and, uh, fungi and microorganisms may be killed by conventional methods such as autoclaving, but the fungal hyphae waste products which contain carbon-14 derived from atmospheric CO2 will be almost impossible to remove by standard chemical washing procedures. And I would agree with that. Assuming that a sample of coal contains no carbon-14 microbial action only has to result in the deposition of about 0.1% by weight of modern carbon in the coal to produce an apparent age of 45 kilo years for the specimen. It's 0.2% more or less for 40 uh, 
40,000 uh, uh, 40, years. <coughs> Skipping over paragraph conclusions and recommendations, and I say I didn't separate that out. Um, this came from a PDF that jammed everything together, and I had to separate every word. It's a pain in the neck. Um, I suggest that a good source of carbon-14 free materials for carbon-14 background and contamination tests is likely to be found by investigating geological deposits of graphite. If these graphites are pure, sulfur-free, and stored dry under nitrogen, the possibility of microbial or fungal action should be remote. If they are not stored under dry nitrogen and sulfur-free, they should still be really hard. But anyway, uh, <coughs> I also suggest that freshly mined dry coal samples be tested for carbon-14 content and that the carbon-14 activity be monitored routinely after the samples are stored in laboratory air. Yeah, it'd be, can this work? Do a little experimenting. Yes. Such samples could be used as standards to check for the introduction of carbon-14 due to microbial activity after exposure of the coal specimen to moisture and air. And now this was, what, 1989 or something like that? We should do those experiments, don't you think? I wonder where in the literature it's reported that somebody did it. You know what? I bet you there isn't any literature. And we might be able to change that. <laughs> anyway, now my take on all this. Um, we now have 505 million year old chitin that still survives. Carbon-14 proves it. This is not dependent on Mary Schweitzer. Maybe it's inspired by Mary Schweitzer a little bit, but these guys are totally her name does not appear anywhere on the paper. How does the chitin last so long? The chemists are amazed. Well, they probably should be. Now, don't expect this to be a breakthrough. I mean, you know what will happen is they'll just say, well, chitin lasts that long. But, you know, it's kind of comforting for creationists, don't you think? Um, <clears throat> the carbon-14 date is noticeably different from infinite. 0.57% uh, is actually measurable. Um, I encourage other carbon-14 dates of this kind. The more, the merrier, in my opinion. The date fits creationist expectations. Um, I'm glad I don't have to defend long ages using carbon-14. I would, I would really, you know, I would really have, hate to be arguing that, that point. And I, I think the future looks very rosy for carbon-14 uh, as a uh, tool to try to resolve this um, dispute between uh, creation and evolution. But, you know, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. <coughs> uh, how long do you think they had to count that thing to get that point oh oh five? Oh, not that long. Not that long, huh? No. It, see, that was not done by, by putting it into a jar and having, uh, having the carbon-14 decay. Nobody does that anymore. It's too slow. It takes two big samples. Uh, you stick it in the AMS machine and you actually count the atoms. And the atoms can be counted probably in under an hour. Uh, maybe 90 minutes if you're being real careful. Uh, they, they used to take days for some of these. Cover 14 days, I say. I just said they used to take. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, uh, oh yeah. In fact, some of the really long ones would take weeks. Uh, and they'd have to do it under a, under a thing, under the, under the ground. And the thing that was bad is that they used as their blanks anthracite coal, which means that if you had 0.05% in the sample, and you had 0.5% in the, in the coal, you wouldn't be able to detect a difference. What you really need is either some of that graphite that they talked about, or maybe even carbon-14 that has been, uh, uh, or carbon that has had the carbon-14 removed mm -hmm. by mass, spectro mass spectroscopy. I think that would be the way to go. What I'd like to see is some studies on the kinetics of the chitin molecule. 
Yes, it would be interesting. And it would be interesting because, you know, in British Columbia up there, it rains and um, that stuff, I'm sure, got wet. You just shake your head and you look at it and you go, are we supposed to believe that this stuff lasted for 500 million years without hydrolyzing? The, the chemistry is just... <laughs> anyway. Technique question. <clears throat> Pardon me. Using the best equipment today, how far back can you go in recognizing carbon-14? <coughs> the oldest date in the literature was done by one R. Irvin Taylor and his associates uh, in uh, uh, 1985. at UC Irvine, and it was 85,000 years. Well, that gives at least a, a bit of a margin to, to, to increase confidence in the validity of these 30 to 50,000 year ages. Yes, it does. Now, I will have to say that there are issues with how, how well they do their uh, laboratory procedures because there have been a few people who have done recycling experiments where they take the graphite and then they oxidize it to, uh, carbon, uh, to carbon dioxide and then they re-reduce it just to see what the, you know, what the, uh, uh, what the blank of the sample is. And there are some laboratories that get in the neighborhood of 0.18% uh, modern carbon in there. Um, there is one laboratory, uh, which is the one that we're it was using, uh, was used by the ICR people, that uh, um, got 0.07% uh, blanks. And I think that that's probably, well, actually, when they used carbon-12 that had been artificially um, decontaminated from carbon-14, uh, methane has been distilled. And methane-12, with, methane with carbon-12 distills at a lower temperature than methane with carbon-14. And it also distills with less uh, than carbon-13. And so they could use the carbon-13 as a proxy for the carbon-14. Um, that when they did that, they were getting 0.057%. Uh, so they're, they're pretty good about it. I mean, 0.057% is down there. But remember, this is 0.5% that they're getting for this, 0 0.57. Uh, so it's like 10 times what that other... It's an order... It's magnitude, magnitude uh, more than That's the right. minimum. I mean, we're down, we're near the bottom, but we're not at the bottom by any stretch. And in fact, there's one laboratory that was unable to statistically tell that they had added any carbon-14 at all from their recycling. It's a, a University of Aust a Na Australian National University at Canberra, they had a special apparatus that they were advertising was the best, and looks like it was the best, and they were getting very, very low uh, carbon-14 from what they call geological graphite, which is what this guy was suggesting. It's probably originating in the Precambrian. There's some suggestion that the metamorphosis might have happened during the Cambrian, uh, but the, the material itself is entombed <coughs> Precambrian. And so they thought they, they had it nailed. Well, they're still getting a little bit of carbon-14 in it, but, but they don't add anything by the processing, which means that the carbon-14 they're getting is probably residual activity. Uh, two quick follow-up questions. Uh, one, what was the purpose in publishing the paper on uh, carbon-14 and chitin in Cambrian? Uh, oh. Came fossils number two. Uh, we'll go ahead with number well, one. Well, okay. Well, number one is 
we're the best. Okay, we've got, we, we leapfrogged the Ordovician. We leapfrogged the Silurian. We've got the oldest stuff. And, you know, whenever somebody says oldest or best or, you know, it's the same kind of thing that people try to find the oldest uh, living fossil or oldest fossils of uh, uh, life, let's say, you know, it's 3.4 million years or billion years, 3.8 billion years. If you could tack out, in a, you know, 3.9 billion years, now you're the reigning champion. So there's a, a, a certain amount of pride in how, how far back we can get this stuff. Okay. And towards that end, they have to prove that it's really this stuff. And that's why they did all this, you know, X-ray fluorescence microscopy and, you know, um, uh, <coughs> they did a HPLC, they did uh, a HP uh, size exclusion chromatography, you know, the whole, the whole yeah. bit. The, the array of, of techniques was very impressive. Yeah, I, because they want to absolutely nail down that this is really chitin, Number one. Number two is it really came from the fossil. Sure. And so now we have the oldest fossil actual material. So one is bragging rights, but two, there is, if we have this material, now we can do isotopic analysis and say what temperature the waters were and so forth. Because, um, when things get colder, more oxygen-18 tends <laughs> to go into it. And so, I mean, you can, you can do correlations of oxygen-18 isotopes with, uh, with, with surface water temperatures, and, uh, and, that's, uh, and that's, where they, that's where they think it's kind of practical. But you're saying, look, they're saying, we got this stuff half a billion years old. That's the actual stuff. And the dilemma they create in doing that is now that they've done the carbon-14 day, guess what? It isn't that old. Well, it's contamination. Uh, but they're certainly not saying that, are they? No, they're not. Uh, I, they, I've, they I've been asking say, my... <laughs> they didn't say a word about... Well, I read you the entire hmm. carbon-14 stuff that they had commented. And basically, all they're using it for is to say, no, this is original material. It's not stuff that came from bacteria that crept into there while we were, you know, while the sample was sitting somewhere and that produced this material. Of course, bacteria don't do chitin anyway, but maybe fungi would, fungi. Well, with my experience in attempting to publish, I'm guessing that the implications for the age of the fossil uh, would have had to have been addressed, but reviewers said, no, we can't go there. So it was just left blank. I don't see how you could avoid it. Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, is it really like 40, 40 45,000 years old? <coughs> no. Um, Paul, Maybe. Everybody knows that it's wrong. So why bother? Reviewers wouldn't worry about it. I think they're, I think I think they're, they're, so, they're so sure. I think they're avoiding the question because they know that if you start talking about what we finished up with, you'll never get that thing published. Or, any, or anything else you do. Yeah. Or anything, that's right, or any future publications. You're, you're toast. Yes. The past studies, they've indicated that there is soft tissue in fossils. So how do they determine that age versus, versus the chitin here? Because that, that would be another soft tissue, theoretically, wouldn't it? Um, Mary Schweitzer has refused to do carbon-14 dating on her samples. Jack Horner was offered $28,000, $50,000, whatever you want, to date some of his specimens with carbon-14 dating and turned it down. 
He knew it was a creationist that was making the offer. And the official reason was that we don't cooperate with you. Um, whether that's because he hates creationists or whether that's because he's afraid that what would happen to him would be the same thing that happened to uh, the laboratory that did the creationist uh, coal samples, where it just disappeared. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, know, I do know that we have recorded phone conversation of him and Bob Enyart uh, going after it, you know, you know, would you do this date? <coughs> uh, no. Well, you know, is it not enough money? No, it's not the money. Literally, it's not the money. Well, if he wouldn't use carbon-14 dating, then what dating system did he use? Well, it, mostly um, the geologic setting, uh, which is a combination of their uh, dinosaurs of a particular type that's normally found in the Cretaceous. And in the case of the Triceratops and the, uh, and the uh, T-Rex, they're the later Cretaceous. Um, and so, you know, the, the dates are just known from just general uh, in the stratigraphy, where, which strata were they found in, which have been um, potassium argon dated, rubidium strontium dated, uh, uranium lead dated, uh, although that's an interesting question. Uh, if, you try to, if you try to pin those down, you find out that there's all kinds of problems. Uh, in fact, you may remember this one. They're publishing 550 million years. Now it's 505 million years, same strata. But the strata, uh, I, have a, I have a neat little chart from uh, Absolute Age Determination by Mavis Guy and uh, Helmut Schleicher, which has a fold out thing and they draw the Cambrian and you can see it's going, uh, you know, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, and they, they have this whole thing and it's just going up and down and up and down. I guess I should do it this way for you. Uh, you know, the, the original is quite young, and then, then it got older, and then it got younger, and then it got older, and then it, and then it stayed old for a while, and then it's kind of drifted down. It's now, um, the, the official date for the beginning of the Cambrian used to be 600 million years. It's now like f more like 540. Um, and this particular stratum in the middle Cambrian, where they're doing it, used to be 550, and then now it's about uh, 505. So, you know, it, I guess the kind way of saying it is not ex an exact science. Is there a dating system that's reasonable and accurate and et cetera, Well, et cetera? I think carbon-14 dating is pretty reasonable, uh, especially once you understand how it's done, but uh, they're not going to accept 40,000 years, let alone uh, uh, you know, uh, 5,000 years. This is the fun part we're, we're, we're dealing with. Um, you can just, uh, I mean, it's all throughout the literature. I collected 70 of actual published stuff that showed carbon-14 in various materials. And if you read this guy, he says there's a bunch of unpublished stuff that backs it up. Just nobody gets around to publishing it for whatever reason. Side question. Any chance you could use a mass spec to produce a carbon-14 free sample? Uh, yes, there's a pretty good chance, and uh, that's one of the things I'd like to do if I have the chance. Uh, and then, you know, and then compare it with the geologic graphite, uh, compare it with various diamonds. If we can find a big diamond or, or, or 
a big file of, of uh, graphite that, that actually is low, then we can use that instead of having to make our own all the time. Um, and, and you could say that, well, whatever you get with that carbon is maybe background, but at least the stuff that's above it is now real. And if you do your laboratory carefully enough, we should be able to get some interesting answers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also try to go into coal and look around for, for uh, hyphae and, and see whether, we, uh, whether the, that hypothesis really does hold weight or not. Because it's still kicking around. Uh, Kirk Birchie in particular has, has thrown it out as a, uh, as a possibility. Anyway, <clears throat> come back. Um, next week we'll talk, talk about theistic evolution. And in two weeks, um, we'll have uh, uh, Chris Roop here uh, talk about uh, the, the massive work that he did, which we're very thankful for, by the way.